Please stand for the reading of their scripture this morning, if you're able. Um, we're going to be going through a few different verses, starting in 1 Timothy 5.8. In your pew Bible, you'll find that on page 1188. And again, we'll start in 1 Timothy 5.8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those in his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Sliding down to verse 21, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. Do not lay hands upon another too hastily and therefore share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. And if we slide down to chapter 6, Verse 1, all who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honors so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Those who, are, are, those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake in the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of standing in your presence gathered as your church, as your people. Lord, I pray this morning that as we look into your word again, that you would open our minds and our hearts to hear from you. Lord, help us never to take for granted the fact that when we hear your word read, when we hear your word expounded upon, we are hearing from you. So give us ears to hear and hearts to receive that we would be changed by your word through the power of your spirit. Guide us in your truth this morning. Anything that would be out of line with you, we pray that you would convict us of that, that we would confess that to you. Anything that we would hear that would be evidenced in our lives we give you praise for. Lord, there is nothing good in us except for you. Remind us of that and help us to believe it's true so that we will turn to you not just in the difficult times but when everything is going swimmingly and that we would give you thanksgiving and praise and glory and honor that you are worthy of. So speak to us now. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. You can have a seat. This morning is a little bit different <clears throat> as far as what we would normally do or what we've been doing as we've been walking through 1 Timothy, in that, uh, as you already saw, instead of having a passage of Scripture where we take, oh, five or ten, or recently I think we even had one message that was like 40-something verses, but rather than do that, uh, we kind of skipped around a little bit in these last two chapters of Paul's first letter to Timothy. And the reason for that is, is that there's, there's a change even in what Paul is doing here. If you recall from the very beginning, he's been dealing with Ephesus. He's been writing to Timothy, telling him how to lead well there in Ephesus and to stand against the false teaching that has crept in from even amongst themselves. Uh, he's mentioned some different folks that have been uh, put aside, who have been handed over to Satan. Uh, we, we know that this issue of false teaching has been an issue, and so he's been dealing with, to this point, right doctrine, 
Uh, what is the truth of the gospel? How and why should we defend it? How should the church be organized in order to have leadership that will stand firm in the faith and, and will fight against uh, false doctrine and false gospels that would lead others astray? And so we came through, and of course we have that, that verse that's sort of the theme for the whole letter uh, that we dealt with a few weeks ago, and we've mentioned it a couple times since, which is in chapter 3, verse 15, that he, Paul says, Timothy, I'm writing this letter so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the church of God, of the living God, which is the buttress or the foundation of the truth. And so he's been telling Timothy, this is how things should be set up. This is how things should run. These are the character traits of leadership. Uh, This is how I want men and women to behave and honor God in his house. But the truth is, is that it goes beyond the house, right? The household of God, when we gather together on a Sunday morning, that is the church. It's not this building. We could gather at the park. We could, we could gather in a parking lot. We could gather at one of your homes. Uh, if this building burned down tomorrow, this church would still exist because you are the church. And so we don't only spend one hour a week together on a Sunday morning. We exist as the church outside of these walls at other days and times. And so, to Paul's point, it goes beyond simply what happens on a Sunday or what is preached from the pulpit. It does work its way into everyday life. So Paul is moving into some application. How should your lives be lived? And what are the ways in which one ought to conduct themselves in the house? Now, we are the household of God, of the living God, and we are the buttress and support of the truth, or the defenders of the truth. So what does it mean to defend the gospel? It does not only mean that we have right thinking. Pastor Corey mentioned this last week. It's not just our orthodoxy. It's not just right thinking about God and the gospel and who Jesus is and what it means. It's orthopraxy. It's how we function, how we live. And how we live when we are not assembled as the church. How we live day in and day out. So uh, Paul has given Timothy instructions on what that should look like in the life of elders and deacons. And we have those lists in chapter 3 that outline all of those characteristics. And if you remember back when we dealt with those chapters, there's a, a theme that we have mentioned that we continue to mention, and that is this. Oftentimes we look at those characteristics of elders and we say, Elder, deacon, they're, they're up here. I'm down here. The reality is, is that those same characteristics that are given for elders and deacons should be the same characteristics of every believer, whether they hold those offices of leadership or not. Now that's proven if we were to go over to Titus 2. Titus, Paul writes a similar letter to Titus, who's on Crete, And he begins outlining what that looks like. Chapter 1, he pretty much echoes what he tells Timothy in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. Uh, This is what elders should look like and deacons. And then in chapter 2, he he turns the page and he starts talking about how relationships and interactions within God's church, within the relationships of the body of Christ, should happen. And he talks to old men and young men and old women and slaves and all these different groups. And if we were to spend time this morning, which we're not going to, if you were here last Sunday afternoon, then you did get that opportunity. But I encourage you, go and look at Titus 2. And if we read through that, we see that the very things that he's instructing older men and younger men and older women and bond servants to do and to be are, are a a continuation. It's a, it's a mirror. It's, it's exactly the same things as he lays out for the characteristics of elders and deacons. So this is for all of us. And Paul is now turning the page to the larger church and their interactions with one another. And so this morning, what I want to do is uh, I'm going to just sort of take a bird's eye view. That's why we're jumping around. I, I want to kind of introduce this theme And then next week, Pastor Corey is going to spend more time digging down into specifics of this. But that's where we're going today. So we're talking about the fact that Paul has a desire for how one ought to conduct himself in the household of the living God, the church. And this is now transitioning from elders, deacons, Timothy, to all of us. The truth is, is that how we live from day to day 
will either confirm or bring shame on the name of Christ. Right now, there is a much profiled, it's probably because it's May and nothing's happening, but there is a, a trial going on right now in a civil court that I have paid little to no attention to other than to know that I, I know it's happening because I keep seeing people saying something or seeing things about it, but there is a defamation lawsuit going on right now between a couple of, of actors who were married at one point. Some of you probably know what I'm talking about. And the whole point is to come to court together and prove that this person spoke wrongly and falsely about this person. And in doing so has damaged their character, their reputation, and has impacted their ability to work, to, to have their good name in society. So this person wants this person to be punished for that. And they want to clear their name. They want to be vindicated. Vindication is an interesting word. I, I think we all understand what it is, but I want to tell us anyway, just so we can be reminded. Vindication means to free from allegation or blame. It means to confirm or substantiate something as true or right. It means to provide justification or defense for to justify something. It means to protect from attack or encroachment. We would use the word defend. Vindication is the defense of someone or something. And so Paul, when he's talking to Timothy, when he's writing to Timothy in chapter 3, verse 15, and lays out that verse that we've said, and I've mentioned several times already that this is how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, uh, the, the, for, the, the, the buttress in support of the truth means we defend the truth of the gospel. But it goes beyond our words. It goes beyond our thinking, and it goes to our acting, how we conduct ourselves, literally. Literally as the household of God. So in this, in, this, uh, in this series, we've been calling the series Living as God's Household. Why? Because it's an as, it's an action. We could talk about living in the household. That's what Paul says, is how to conduct oneself in. But we are talking about how we conduct ourselves as. And so this morning, the shift that we're making that Paul is making is from doctrine to deeds. From doctrine to deeds. The easiest, shortest way to say that is this. Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. Now words are meaningful. They are impactful. The word of God is ultimately, eternally, true and impactful it brings freedom to the oppressed the oppressed by sin those who are slave to sin are set free by the word of god by the truth of the gospel words do matter but as we live in the household and as we live as the household and as we live as the household in the culture and society around us our words our talk can become very cheap if our deeds do not match the doctrine we espouse. If our orthopraxy does not match up with our orthodoxy. The gospel in Paul's day was under attack from the Jews. That's the issue here in some form. In Ephesus, there are Judaizers, those who are teaching that the gospel itself is not enough. You have to follow the Old Testament law. And Paul strictly, I mean here and then even more strongly, as you remember in Galatians, deals directly with that. If anyone brings to you a gospel other than one that I have, one that is the true gospel, if anyone brings in the law or tries to get you to go back to that, let them be accursed, whether it's a man or even an angel from heaven. Let them be anathema. Let them be under a curse. There is only one true gospel. And so the gospel was under fire directly in Ephesus, where Paul is writing to Timothy. The, the empire as a whole had suspicions and, and slandered the gospel. 
The church would talk about things like eating and drinking the blood of Christ, right? The body of Christ. This is my body broken for you. Uh, this is the covenant. Uh, the, the cup is the new covenant. My blood shed for you. And so the empire turned that into, oh, they're, they're cannibals. That's pretty, that's pretty big slander. Or like happens here sometimes too, and in a lot of Baptist churches, they would refer to one another as brother or sister. And then people would say, well, they call each other brother and sister, but they're married. That's not right either. And so there would be charges of impropriety in those ways against the church. The real reason was to impugn the church and to see that it's stamped out. So whether it's from the Judaizers or the culture at large, there were challenges to the gospel and there was slander to the gospel. It was under fire. Today we live in a, and I don't want to say it's like it was back then and now today, it's been continuous from the very beginning. We live in a time and in a culture and in a world where the gospel is slandered, where it comes under fire. There's plenty of uh, ammunition, and I, you, can, you, can, you already know ways that it's under fire from the world itself, but even from within the church, just like the Judaizers, there are those who would lead people away from the true gospel. And the way that that happens most nowadays is by teaching a half gospel. The gospel of God loves you, period. A gospel that focuses only on the love of God, that does not deal with the justness of God or the holiness of God or the righteousness of God, that does not deal with our sin condition, is not the gospel. It's an attack on the gospel. It impugns the gospel. It makes the gospel unnecessary, which is probably the biggest problem altogether. If God loves you and everyone's going to make it and everything's okay and you can continue on in your sin, wait, what is sin? We don't even think sin exists nowadays in some places and in some churches. We certainly don't talk about it. But the truth is, if we don't come to grips and face to face with the fact that we are dead in our sin and on our way to hell justly because we are rebellious in our spirit and in our hearts against the one true sovereign king of the universe, we will stay dead in our sins. And the love of God will not be applied to us. Only when we come to an end of ourselves and confess our sins are we in Christ. So God does love us, but though for those who are his, he loves us too much to leave us lost enslaved to sin, dead in our sins. He brings us to life in Christ and gives us a new nature. And yet we are also instructed to make sure we are working out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are told to put on the new man. There is something we must do. And in short, that is to be led by the Spirit and to live in such a way that our words, our deeds match our doctrine. Because talk is cheap. And if we fail to do that, then we bring shame and slander upon the good news and the good name of Jesus Christ. So Paul lays out for us four brief snapshots. The first is in 1 Timothy 5.8 that we're going to look at today. But if anyone does not provide for his own especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Many people would find it surprising. Many people that are, I don't want to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to hedge what I'm getting ready to say. Some of us might just be surprised. Those who are self-righteous will be very surprised that there could be anyone worthy or worse than an unbeliever. I mean, what can be worse than that? What could be worse than that is to be a believer and not live as one. We call that a hypocrite. And before we get too upset, or maybe we should be, all of us are hypocrites. Not a one of us is without sin. Not a one of us is righteous in and of ourselves. It is only Christ who is our righteousness. 
If there's one thing I want you to take away from this message, there's actually more than this, but I want us to understand this. You are not good. Only Christ. How we care for our household this verse is talking about this. How we care for our household vindicates the gospel. It justifies it. It proves it to be true. It defends it. How so? Christ is our example. God the Father is our example. What does the gospel teach us? While we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for the ungodly. He cared enough for us to give his only life. He brought us freedom and salvation. He's provided the one thing that we need more than anything else in this world. I'll say that again because it's going to come up later. He provided the one thing that is necessary and more important than anything else in our lives, and that is salvation. And beyond that, because he's a good God, he provides so much more. He provides our needs on a daily basis. Not necessarily our wants, not necessarily the things the world tells us we need, but he provides for his children. He provides for his own. You know what? He even provides for unbelievers. He does cause it, as Jesus said, to rain and to shine on the just and the unjust. More than that, he has provided us with relationship with himself, but with our families. This morning we're here, many of us are here, some of us are here because mom's here and we're here with her today. Ostensibly, or will we think that probably most of us at some point today will at least say, hi mom, love you, thanks. The majority of us will do that in some way and that is fitting. Be thankful to God for your mom. Be thankful to God for your dad. Be thankful to God for whoever he has placed in your family unit, whoever you were born into or adopted into, that is the grace of God for your life. He's provided us those things. As for some of us, he allowed us to find another person that we fell in love with and we marry and we have children and it continues on. That is all God's grace and a blessing. And then beyond that, he gives us an even greater blessing of relationship and that's his family, the church the household. By his grace, he has provided that. Jesus said that if you leave him and, and you have to turn your back on or you are, your backs are turned on you by family and friends because you are part of the family of God, you will not fail to receive a hundred times as many houses and brothers and sisters. Through the Spirit of Christ, we are connected with brothers and sisters all around this world, some that we have not and will never meet until eternity. God has blessed us greatly. He has cared for us. He has provided for his household. So if we serve a God who does that, and a gospel that continues to build that household and provide that need of salvation and all the other needs that they could ever have, what should we as the body of Christ do? We should provide for our own households. We should care for our household. So yes, the example of elders, we remember one of those qualifications for elders and deacons was that they rule or they, they, they uh, serve and lead their families well, their households well. That by the way that they exhibit that leadership in the home, they will then be able to do the same within the church. So they need to manage their household well. Specifically here, as we'll see in coming verses, He's talking about the idea of widows, those who are widows, and he'll define those, caring for them, caring for family, and caring for others. Now, why is this? Well, some people think that within Ephesus, within that culture, there was a lot of, uh, of ignoring of family. There might have been a lot of younger folks who uh, were wrapped up in their, their affluence. It was an affluent city. And they might have ignored or rejected or, or, or just turned away family that needed help. Whatever the reason, Paul reiterates to us that as believers, as the household of God, we must care for our own. That starts with our own families. Mom and dad, lead your families well. Kids, honor your parents. And that doesn't change 
when you become an adult, move out on your own and have your own family. Care for your own. And care for others. And if you don't, Paul says, you're worse than an unbeliever. Because you've been showed much grace and you've been given an example and you live in the household of God that brings in those who are far from God and provides their needs and loves them, cares for them. If you fail to do that, what kind of example is that? Now, remember when we said who the church was? It's us, right? So the church does need to care for its own. But this is how that should look. Someone needs assistance. First level is their kids, their family, brothers and sisters should be caring for them. Don't come to the church and say, help my mom. You help your mom. If for some reason you can't help your mom, or in this, I guess we're going with moms. Happy Mother's Day. If for some reason you can't help your mom, then the next place should be that discipleship group that you're a part of. See, this is another reason why you need to be in a discipleship group if you are not. Because you have, that's the first place of you caring for one another and you being cared for in all areas and in all ways. Encouragement, accountability, and yes, love and care. So get in a discipleship group. If you've got questions, come see me. But discipleship groups should be rallying around those that are part of their group. And if that's not able to take care of it, then come and we do have a deacon fellowship that serves well. And the greater church as a whole then can step in. But this is about individual members of the household. Serve your family well. Love your household. Let the world see you exhibiting Christ in this way. The Emperor Julian in 360, he ruled from 361 to 363. He was not, he was like the grandson of Constantine. So Constantine you know, uh, supposedly became a Christian and the emperor was Christian. He went the other way. He, he deconverted from Christianity and went back to the old ways, the old gods of Rome. And so he considered Christianity atheism because they didn't believe in the pantheon of gods. This is what he said, and some of you are familiar with this. The Emperor Julian said this, uh, Atheism, or Christianity, has been especially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. In other words, there was a pandemic going on and the church was standing in. It's a scandal that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar and that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor but for ours as well. While those who belong to us, or those who are part of this Roman society and worship all the gods, they look to us in vain for the help that we should render them. A man who was against the church recognized the goodness of God, the actions of the gospel. And the result was people's lives were literally saved physically, and we know they were also saved spiritually and eternally. This is just a question for thought, and then we're going to move on. I just want to kind of pull the pen and throw it out there. Could it be that the church, uh, could it be, <laughs> rhetorical maybe, could it be that the church has ceded their responsibility for the world, and now we just depend on the government to meet people's needs? Moving on. Verses 21 and 22, second snapshot. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. How we, how we and who we choose to follow also vindicates the gospel if we do it properly. What's the proper way? Well, from this, elders are to be well chosen. He's given a, a list of characteristics for elders, but how they are chosen should also be done in a right way. How we then decide who we're going to follow. So there's an application within the church, which we'll talk about, but there's an application outside the church too that we'll mention. Elders should be well chosen. No partiality. Partiality means giving preferential treatment. So just so we know, power and influence are not virtues listed in the qualifications of an elder. 
Someone who is brilliant, someone who is rich, someone who is successful in business, someone who has uh, been here, their family's been here since the first brick was laid of the church building, those do not qualify an elder for service. And to choose people on those types of things is showing partiality. And James tells us in chapter 2, verse 9, that partiality is sin. In fact, he gives that very idea. Someone comes in and they're well put together and they're rich and they're well thought of and you give them special treatment and you push the poor brother to the side. He says that sin. God himself is not a respecter of persons. He does not look at the outside, if anything of the story of David tells us that, right? He doesn't look at the outside. Samuel, it's none of these other guys. It's the young, ruddy one because God knows his heart. And this is how leaders should be, check, uh, should be chosen and count and, 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 and selected. Character counts. Someone who is powerful and influential can be very easily overbearing and unkind and argumentative and all these things that elders and deacons should not be. They also may not be well thought of outside the church because, let's be honest, a lot of people are successful in business because they will cut corners, be aggressive, be hostile, because they serve the almighty dollar. Paul's saying those aren't the kind of people we want. Those aren't the kind of people that should be put in leadership. They should not be shown partiality because of their name or their reputation or their influence or their power. They should be put in positions of leadership if their reputation is Christ, if their identity is is Christ, if their character and maturity is and reflects Christ. Why? Because poor choosing, showing partiality, will bring shame on the church and on the name of Christ and on his gospel. How often have we seen disqualified leadership in churches? A lot of times it's in the world we see high-profile pastors who are very dynamic They can collect a following. They're very good with people. They're movers and shakers. And then their ministry is blown up because there's failure. Paul is saying, don't be quick when you are doing this because who you choose to follow matters. Who you recognize as elders matters. When an elder fails, it affects the whole body. And those who have perhaps hastily laid on hands, share in their shame. You share in their sins. It's what's meant by saying don't lay on hands too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Be slow. Watch them. Watch their life. See if they're reflecting Christ. Because the way they live is more important than who they are or who they think they are, who we think they are. If we too quickly, in showing partiality, select men who don't possess character that's required, the name of Christ can be dishonored and there's probably going to be false teaching along the way. Part and parcel. So our doctrine is guarded and we select people we select men we recognize the Holy Spirit selects we recognize leadership after taking time to test and to watch and to pray and to discern their orthopraxy said there's an outside church application too and this one will be brief it's very popular in today's church world especially in social media to jump on the bandwagon of anyone or anybody or anyone who decides to give what oftentimes is simply lip service to God. A favorite actor, a favorite sports person, a favorite singer, whoever it might be, someone famous and well-known, partiality by the way, who declares that they're a Christian or thanks the good man upstairs, and the church is so quick to jump on that and affirm that and say, look everybody, they're a believer which I really think comes down to this. They're cool, you like them, like me too. We're not all bad. 
because we're more concerned about what the world thinks about us than what they think about Christ and the truth of the gospel. And so we affirm and we uphold people who have no business being affirmed or being given the name Christian. And here's the thing. I I know that sometimes they say wonderful things. Oftentimes, if you listen, there is no mention of the actual gospel. There is no actual mention of Jesus Christ saved me a sinner. There's a lot of thanks, God. Got me here. Made my payday. Got me the award. And oftentimes, if you look at their life as it is public, you will see an absence of Christ-like living. And we, and when we as the church affirm those who we do not know, have not tested, and who ultimately, most times, prove themselves not to be a follower of Christ, by affirming them, we are bringing shame on the name of Christ. Chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. This is the hardest one. Stick with me. All who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who who partake in the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. What in the world do we do with slavery, with what Paul's saying here? In short, how we serve those in authority over us vindicates the gospel. How we respond to those in authority over us vindicates the gospel. And there is obviously different ways that happens in today's society, although there is actually more slavery around the world today than ever before. In our culture, in our country, it has been something that's in the past, regardless of what we could debate about the continuing influences or not. But I think that we have to look at real quick what Paul is saying and what he's not saying. What Paul is saying, in short, is that God's name is more important than your personal freedom. God's name, the gospel, is more important than your personal freedom. That flies right in the face of our ethics as Americans where we are independent and we have rights. If Paul was writing this to us, he might say, God's name is more important than your rights, than your personal rights. So if if, if someone, uh, if, if standing up for the Second Amendment is going to cause shame to come on the name of Christ, be quiet. If you having the right to speak your mind because of the First Amendment is going to bring shame on the name of Christ, keep your mouth shut. Slavery in that time and culture most often was political. It was the result of wars where slaves were taken. It could be other political issues. It was not primarily or normatively what we know of as slavery within our own history. It was not ethically uh, or ethnically based. It was not racially based most often. In fact, the Bible clearly says in the Old Testament that man-stealing, the, the exact kind of slavery we had where people went over to the continent of Africa and literally stole people and enslaved them, that is prohibited by the, by the scriptures. A lot of times it could be indentured servitude. But sometimes it was just slavery. We had a war, Rome won, you lost, we're taking some of you back. What Paul is doing here is not approving of slavery because that isn't the issue. In his instructions here, he is instructing us that God's name is more important important than our personal freedoms. And how we live should follow with that. Now, 
Paul did not support slavery. And he, he did support people being free. In 1 Corinthians 7, he said this, were you called while a slave? Did you become a believer while you were a slave? Don't worry about it. Right there, don't worry about being a slave. You were, you're, you've been called by Christ. You're free in him. But then he goes on, but if you are able also to become free, do that. You see, it's not that slavery is good. It's not. It's wrong. But it's not more important than the gospel. So for us, we serve for Christ's sake. Whether we are at a place where our boss is terrible and the worst person ever, how you respond to them will either vindicate the gospel or cement in their mind that it's all a lie. Your rights are not important. The name of Christ is. The gospel is. Paul tells Titus that he, urged, he should urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything. To be well-pleasing. To not be argumentative. To not be pilfering. Don't be, don't be stealing pens on the side, right? But showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior with every respect, that they would honor the name of God. Who? That your employer, in this case, that your master would honor God because of your actions, because of how you work, even within that perspective. Here in verse 1 he says that, so that the name of our God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. And then he says this, if you are a believer... And your master's a believer, serve them all the more. It's to your benefit and theirs. Serve them all the more. Now he does speak to, to masters, to Christian masters. Lee and Griffin, in their commentary on First and Second Timothy and Titus, say this, Paul did not emphasize individual rights, but individual responsibilities. The chief concern for Paul was the glory of God, not manumission of slaves or an increase in privilege for the owners. He demanded a changed attitude from both. Philemon, I'm sending Onesimus back to you, that slave years that ran away, he is now a believer. He is now a, but, a brother in Christ. Receive him as a brother in Christ. Treat him as a brother. Onesimus, go back and serve Philemon well. You're now useful. You used to be useless. Now you're useful because you're going to serve as if serving Christ. Kostenberger says it this way, God's honor and the preaching of the gospel are more important than personal freedom. For us today, we don't, as far as I know, face slavery on a daily basis. But we might have less than enjoyable bosses or we might feel pressure of social issues and uh, constitutional things how you live and how you respond to the government to your bosses to any circumstance or situation or discussion topic how you handle yourself in those can vindicate and should vindicate the gospel because you know that your freedom is nothing and his name and glory are everything Finishing up, verses 3 and 4, if anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he, that person who doesn't agree, is conceited and understands nothing. Is conceited and understands nothing. Church, how we hold to the words of Christ will vindicate the gospel. How we choose to believe and live and uphold in the way we live them will vindicate the gospel. Or we can decide that we want to live our own way. Paul is saying that false doctrine is the purview, it's the M.O. of arrogant ignorance. Arrogant ignorance. They are conceited and understand nothing. One of the greatest damages to the name of Christ in today's society in the church is people who say they are in the church who say I am a Christian and they have decided to disregard the word of God itself 
They've stripped it of its authority. They've decided that they know better, that everyone over the 2,000 years and those who died literally for it were wrong. And there are things that are just different nowadays. And the Bible is old and outdated and probably a little oppressive. I mean, after all, you say that my rights don't matter. And so they've decided that their way and the way of the world is more preferable. And we twist and turn Scripture where we can to support that, or we ignore it altogether where we can't. It's false doctrine. The gospel that says God is love and fails to say God is holy and God is righteous and God is just. And we are sinners and we deserve everlasting punishment is not the gospel. The gospel is good news. The good news is you don't deserve it. You are guilty. You are not good. You are a sinner. You have rejected the one true God. You have usurped his authority and placed yourself on the throne of your life. And you deserve eternal punishment for it. The punishment for treason is death. And that's what's just. And no one argues about that when it comes to earthly kingdoms. Oh, but God. No, 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 no. A loving God would never be just. Well, do we want our judges to be just? If a judge is letting people go left and right regardless of what they've done, is that love? No. A loving judge will uphold the law. They will be just. But we live in a day and time where even those who claim the name of Christ trample his truth cheapen his sacrifice and preach a false gospel, a partial gospel that leaves people in their sin because why do I need to do anything different? This wisdom is the purview of arrogant ignorance. It is anti-Christ. It's demonic. James 3.15, this wisdom that is not which comes down from above. In other words, it's not godly wisdom. It's not godly truth and wisdom. But this wisdom is earthly, natural, and demonic. Why? Because the enemy wants people to go to hell. The enemy does not want you to be saved. The enemy does not want you to be changed. The enemy does not want you to be freed. The enemy does not want you to receive the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ who gave his life for you and for me. And so he will tell people that church people are just good people and good people are just good people and all good people will go to heaven and God won't send anyone to hell. Folks, it's amazing that he saves any of us. That's why it's amazing grace. It's not just a nice song. It's a reality. Not a single person here, and I will say primarily me, because I know me far better than you know me, and he knows me far better than I know myself, and I am aware that I do not deserve his grace. There is nothing good in me. Anything that's good about me is Christ alone and because of him. And the same is true for you, whether you choose to believe it or not. But here's good news. Christ Jesus died for the ungodly. And what was sung earlier, what he's done for me, he can do for you. There's not a sinner he can't save. If that's not what we're telling people, may we be accursed because we're leaving them dead in their sin. The world and its wisdom is wrong. This is true. This is freedom. This is life. This is hope. This is joy. This is peace. Adorn ourselves with godliness. Not just so that God's word will not be spoken against, but because something else can happen. 
See, right doctrine is essential for right living. And right living verifies and vindicates the gospel to all who would seek to defame it. The result of this then is that others come to life through the gospel. When we live what we say we believe, it's proven to be true. People see a difference and they will be brought forward. They will be attracted. Christ will bring them to himself. We are witnesses, martyrs of the gospel. Martyr is the actual word there. Witnesses. And so just like the disciples started in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth, we too in our church gathering and in our homes and in our jobs and in our communities and in the world, we are examples, witnesses to the gospel. And when people see the evidence, see the truth, see the validity of the gospel in lives of people like you and me, they take notice. And the Holy Spirit works through his people to share this truth and to draw boys and girls and men and women who are far from God to him. A different writer said it this way. 1 Peter chapter 2. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Keep your behavior, your orthopraxy, excellent amongst the world. So that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Very quickly, the day of visitation, that's when he returns. That's when he returns as judge. It means a judging, the actual word there. He's coming back as a judge. And if our deeds as the household of God match our doctrine, there will be those who are going to, well, all of them are going to glorify God when he comes, when Christ returns. But there's two ways that's going to happen. Some of them are going to bow the knee because everyone's going to bow their knee and confess him as Lord. Some are going to do that by choice, and it's because they saw the truth of the gospel and the life of God's people, the household, and they were drawn to him, and they themselves placed their faith in him. So when he returns as judge, they will welcome him as returning king and will be joyful and full of glory that they give to him. Then there will be those who trash the name of Christ, who defame the gospel, who run it down, who say it's not true, who say there is no God, who say there's no such thing as sin, who cheapen grace and go on sinning because grace will abound. And when he comes, they too are going to glorify him. You know why? Because he's worthy of it. And he's going to receive it. But the day of visitation for them is not going to be filled with joy. They're going to acknowledge the truth, but there will be no joy for them. Jesus said it this way, let your light shine before men in such a way, in Matthew 5, 16, in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Folks, doctrine alone is not enough. Doctrine alone is not the gospel, meaning We can't say that we believe the right things and not act on that. You believe what you do. And so the way we live, which again, only happens empowered by the Spirit, the way we live reflects the truth of the message of the gospel. So defending the gospel means living in such a way that it's on display. Not as a way of saving ourselves, not as a checklist of what we do and don't. That's religion. That will leave you lost for eternity. But because we are submitting and craving and seeking the kingdom first, and the power of the Holy Spirit is alive in and through us, and is producing the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. And God is being glorified as his church moves from simply doctrine to deeds and their lights so shine and the world around them either is ashamed because they know that their their lies and their defamation is folly and untrue or because they see it and they say I want freedom and they come to faith in Christ as well Father this morning 
I pray that you will help us to be mindful of our responsibilities to you, not just in words, but in deeds. Lord, it's the hardest part. We still have this sin nature that we war against, but thank you. Thanks be to God that we are not condemned. We are not enslaved to it. We don't have to live that way. We do have a choice. We can fight it. We can mortify and put our sin to death through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we know that only forgiven sins can be defeated, and we know that you have bought and purchased our salvation, our freedom, our forgiveness. And so may we fight the good fight, not just with our words and what we say we believe, but in our actions. And in doing so, may we glorify you in worship and in discipleship and in mission forever and ever until the day of your returning and forevermore. Glorify yourself in our lives. Empower us to live for you and in your grace. Lord, we thank you that those who you've called, you've justified and you will glorify. And we pray this morning that you will indeed hold us fast as we're going to sing, that you will continue to shape us and change us, that you will sanctify us, that our actions and our, our, our deeds reflect your glory because you're alive in us. In Jesus' name.